Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today we're going to be talking about why a completely unconscious will is not a free will. Um, okay, before we do that, I just want to briefly go over what we mean when we say we have a free will. Um, basically, the term free will means that we can decide, think, feel, do whatever we want. I mean, we can't fly, we don't have wings, we can't do stuff like that, but basically, you know, what we do, what we decide is completely up to us. And um, obviously, if we have an unconscious that's the storehouse of all of our information and where the processing of all information must take place to render decisions, um, such a will cannot be free. And obviously, if everything has a reason, if there's a cause for everything, then there's a cause for all of our decisions and a cause for that cause. And so causa causality, cause and effect, also um, make free will impossible. But today, um, for this episode, we're going to just focus on the unconscious component. I want to try to, you know, with the unconscious, I, I think it really is more intuitive than causality for most people. If they realize that, you know, all of our data, all of our memories are in the unconscious, and by definition, we're not even aware that we have this part of our mind, um, then clearly um, our wills cannot be free. Okay, um, and again, the reason I'm doing this show is because, um, you know, the, the belief in free will is, is harmful. You know, it creates pride, it creates arrogance, it creates blame, it creates the, the pain of guilt. I, I, you know, like, for example, under a causal will perspective, we do something wrong and our conscience might tell us that it's wrong and so we might, you know, decide um, to try to not, you know, do the same wrong again, you know. Um, but under a free will perspective, we generally um, tend to punish ourselves. <coughs> we generally say, well, you know, we did wrong, so we deserve to be punished and all. Whereas the causal will perspective, fine. We, we recognize that we've done wrong. Our conscience will hopefully vow to not repeat it, but it could be done um, without afflicting ourselves, you know. All right, um, so, so let's get on with this. Um, how do we generally decide? Think about it. Anything we, we want to um, try to try, decide, any, any, any kind of decision we make. Um, I think one, one component that's always there is like the moral component, moral imperative. Is it, it, would it be wrong to do what, you know, what we want to do, what we want to decide? Would the decision be wrong? Um, so, and then think about it, you know, um, if we're trying to figure out whether it's right or wrong, clearly, um, there's a whole collection of data, principles that we've learned from, from our parents, from teachers, from our friends, from books, from TV, from the movies, you know, um, from religion, um, from philosophy, you know, there's just a lot of of principles, of experiences, of parables, just a lot of memories, a lot of neural, you know, data that um, that can't, contains all these moral experiences, the moral kinds of understandings for the experiences, you know. So, all right, so that um, clearly when we decide the morality component is part of it, and, and then... Um, Another component is like, you know, well, if we're going to make a decision, why are we making it? You know, um, obviously there has to be a motivation or a desire. You know, um, we basically, <laughs> when you think about it, why we make any decision is that we're seeking pleasure <clears throat> and avoiding pain. We're like doing this for ourselves. We're doing this for, um, for those we love. You know, sometimes we will, for example... Um, choose to undergo a certain amount of pain so that others are spared that pain or, you know, the pain for others is minimized or lessened. Um, but that, in, in cases like that, we're kind of like, you know, we're, we're guided by the dictates of our conscience. In cases like that, you know, the, um, the satisfaction, the moral satisfaction we, we would derive from, you know, undergoing a certain amount of pain ourselves for the benefit of the others would um, means more to us than any kind of pleasure we would derive from not doing what we consider the right thing um, in that 
instance. All right, so, and the last, I think, component that um, is part of probably every decision is our past experience, you know, our past knowledge. What are we basing this decision on, you know, apart from the morality of it, apart from, you know, whether we want to do it, our, our desire, or motivation. Um, what, are, what is the reason for it, okay? What is it supposed to do? Um, and again, when, when you think about it, a lot of times when we make decisions, you know, we're, we're not aware of like, you know, sifting through a lot of just possibilities, you know, a lot of options, a lot of options in terms of reasons why we shouldn't do it, why we don't. I mean, sometimes we're, we're conscious of some of them. Some of them come to mind. But for the most part, you know, I think that's maybe why um, sometimes it's referred to as instinct or, you know, we're just relying on, on our instincts, on our gut feeling, you know. But, um, but there are, you know, there are reasons. There's, what happens is all this stuff, um, well, all right, this, that's what this point um, is, shows about. Yeah, the point of this is that, um, that basically all this stuff, our moral principles, our hedonic principles, you know, seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, and our knowledge and, and past experiences, they're all in our unconscious. You know, they're all in our unconscious. Because obviously, think about it, we can't hold that information um, in our conscious mind at any given moment or even like, you know, give us a whole hour. <laughs> you know, we couldn't like be conscious of everything we, um, we know upon which the decision we make is going to be based, has to be based. Okay. So now, all right, I just want to go through a little bit of how we know we have an unconscious because some, some of us might say, wait, you know, you know, what is this unconscious? You know, show me, whatever. I mean, there are physiological ways of doing this. Um, for example, like with an electrode, um, they can, like, um, stimulate a certain area of the brain that will evoke a certain specific memory in, a, in an individual. Um, and then there are ways, like, through hypnosis, where if you hypnotize a person, you give a person a post-hypnotic suggestion to do whatever, then you take them out of hypnosis and they end up doing it and then you ask them, well, why did you do this? And they'll say, well, you know, I felt like it or, you know, it seemed like the right thing to do. Without any awareness at all that the reasons they're doing it is because they have been primed through the post-hypnotic suggestion to do it. I mean, you know. So these are two, two ways of, of demonstrating the unconscious, you know, um, experimentally, empirically in a sense. But it goes more, much beyond that. We, we experience, I mean, like, we, we're aware, we understand that, like, that we've learned so much in the past, that we, we, we know that we know so much. We, we understand that. And then clearly we know that, well, no, we can't hold that stuff in our conscious mind at any given moment. So that's, I think, the strongest um, kind of like indicator to us that yes, we have a vast unconscious, you know. Um, <clears throat> why, how do we have an unconscious, you know? That information has to be stored somewhere, you know. I mean, I mean, one can make the case that, you know, it's stored outside of our brain, but, you know, again, that would run into the neurophysiology, you know, um, evidence, empirical evidence that, you know, certain kind of data is stored um, in certain places, that certain parts of the brain are devoted to certain, um, you know, storage functions, whatever. Um, okay, so the point here is like because all of the data upon which we make our decisions is in our unconscious then clearly the decision-making process has to be in the unconscious. By definition, by our very experience, we understand that our conscious mind does not have access to the unconscious. Well, I mean, some people may say, well, sure, I can draw in, on my unconscious any time I want. Like, for example, I'm thinking of number 36. Okay, and that came from 
um, my conscious will. I mean, actually, I just looked at my paper, and um, this is episode 36 of the show, and so I could say to myself, well, you know, that, that was a perception. That was like, you know, I perceived 36, and I said it, okay? Consciously. It was a conscious decision. But wait a minute, then, you know, um, how about the moral imperative? I mean, you know, um, was I consciously aware of asking myself, well, you know, is there anything wrong with, with saying the, the, the number 36? Um, past experience, knowledge, you know, obviously the number 36 has to have been in my database. But the idea is that, um, that because, because it, our unconscious holds the data upon which we base every decision, then the processing must also be at the level of the unconscious. It can't be, con you know, we don't have access, we don't have real-time access to the unconscious. So basically what you have is the unconscious sifting through material in the unconscious, making a decision, letting our conscious mind know about it, and then the conscious mind, for some reason, deduces that, whoa, I made this decision free of, of anything. Um, and, you know, there's an irony because, like, that delusion, that illusion of free will, that's actually also decided by the unconscious. You know, we don't, we don't consciously decide to, to have that. Okay. So, again... Um, when we make any decision, it's got to be based on considerations. It's got to be based on, is it a reasonable thing to do, for example? You know, we have this reason imperative. It has to make sense. Well, you know, what are the rules of this making sense? You know, um, there are rules for it. They're stored in the unconscious. You know, they... Um, and probably, you know, the, the, the nature of the unconscious is so expansive, it's kind of like, you know, um, a, um, an iceberg where the vast, you know, majority of it is under sea, it's under water. And, um, and so, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, ordinarily I, um, I like to move on to kind of like other kinds of considerations um, you know, when, when I've kind of like, I feel satisfied that I've explained the point as, as much as I um, would need to, but I'm going to stay with this because, because if, if you get this, then you get it, you know, um, and one reason why the unconscious explanation of why do we don't have a free will is perhaps easier to understand than the causal under, um, explanation, you know, that everything has a cause, is that, um, well, with causality, there's a confusion in physics. You know, some people will claim that because the Heisenberg uncertainty and other uncertainties in physics um, prohibit us from simultaneously measuring the position and momentum of a particle, that somehow particle behavior can be quote unquote uncaused, that it's random, completely random in the sense of having no cause, um, so that some things are acausal. Now, to reasoning, that wouldn't help free will either, because if, a, if a, um, a decision is made randomly, certainly is not quote unquote freely willed as we understand the term. But, but because of this confusion as to whether reality is causal or random, and it is causal, you know, it's uh, the, the conclusion that um, that nature is random based on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is just flawed. It's flawed reasoning. But but again, because of that confusion, um, it may be easier for some people to understand. Um, and also, I think it's it's not it's more than that. It's kind of like you know we know we know that there's so much stuff in our unconscious that. We can't access at will. We know that. We know that when we, when we take a test, the reason we're studying really hard is because 
we, um, we can't rely on the unconscious. You know, like if, for example, if we were studying for a test and we just went through the answer of everything once, um, you know, we're, we're, um, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have the assurance that the neural networks um, had been sufficiently created for the retention of that um, knowledge and, and for the retrieval. Because, you know, f you know first, the first part of memory is, you know, you, you memorize something. The second part for the test is to be able to recall it when you need to. So, so we kind of understand we're at the mercy of a part of our brain that we won't be able to control in real time at the time that we need that information, you know, for the test. So we prepare. So we just, like, try to increase the odds that it will be there. And we can do this, certainly. We can, like, you know, remember something so so well, so clearly, that we will be, you know, essentially sure that we know it for the test. But, um, but again, that it's, it's because the unconscious has been kind of like conditioned by the unconscious, of course, to, to um, first want to um, be able to remember that, that information so strongly so um successfully and second um the unconscious is that part of the brain which will you know will again um, allow us to recall that information it's, it's not up to us okay um so all right let's do this again every time we make a decision uh there's a moral component we're, we're, we're raised like this, you know, is it right or wrong? Will it, will it create harm for myself or others or won't it? I mean, and, and, and who among us is aware of making that consideration every time we make a decision? We're not, because it's at the level of the unconscious, okay? And um, our desires, you know, sometimes we have conflicting desires. Sometimes we have uh, a desire to do one thing and a desire to, to do another, and we can't do both. And so what happens then? Um, well, one of those desires will win out. Um, perhaps we can describe that desire as the desire that conforms most completely to our moral imperatives, our hedonic imperatives, our rational imperative. Um, you know, it makes sense. It, it's the most right thing to do. It's, and it's going it, to, we predict, it's going to bring us the most pleasure. But, but here's the thing. Again, there's three components that I just listed. When we make a decision, um, our conscious mind may reflect on, on these kinds of things, but think about it. When, when we, make, we make decisions every second of every day, you know, um, whether unconscious or not. Like, you know, my, my hands sometimes, like, will make gestures when I um, am making a point, a certain kind of point. Um, you know, w every motion is kind of like a decision. And, and clearly, if, 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 the, if, the, um, if it's not a willed decision, or in, o in other words, if it's not um, a quote-unquote decision that we're consciously aware of, not that we made, but we're aware of, then it's, it's happening at, at the unconscious level, you know. But... Um, but the, 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 the crucial points here are that um, any time we have to make a decision, there's a whole mountain of, of data in our, um, in our unconscious that has to get sifted through. It's like with a computer, you know, like, you know, when Google, when you um, input a search term in Google, it, it, it sifts through the database, the, all the internet you know, websites, pages, and all for the, for the exact term that, that you um, have inputted, you know. And that's, that's what the unconscious mind does, you know. And, and naturally, you know, you can understand how a computer, you know, um, would have, you know, my God, so much information to sift through, you know. Um, our, our unconscious mind is the same. We have so many memories. We have so many experiences. And we don't know, you know, we can't consciously know which are going to apply, which are, um, are not. 
This is all done at the level of the unconscious. It's the only way it can be done. Um, okay, I'm done with, with explaining this. Now, I'm going to do a bit more self-promotion here because I think, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, I think I'm pretty much the, the only researcher promoting this particular understanding. I mean, you'll probably find um, philosophers and psychologists, I'm, you, you, you certainly will, you know, referring to the unconscious as a reason why um, free will is not possible. But, um, but it's kind of like, it's the difference between, you know, well, citing it and just, you know, then going on with, with a lot of other stuff and, and recognizing its significance. Um, we were aware of the unconscious when, um, bef before Freud. You know, the mesmerists, the hypnotists were aware of it. Um, Somebody, somebody just told me recently, a couple of days ago, that Nietzsche was aware of the unconscious before Freud, and probably the Greeks. Um, and so, like, what happened is Freud is, is um, that was his, his major, well, yeah, in a certain sense, that, that was his major contribution to, to science, to, to psychology, to, to the understanding of the human mind. I mean, he, he developed... Um, psychoanalysis, you know, talking therapy. I'm not sure if he was the only one, but that's, you know, his greatness was in, um, in, in not just, you know, saying, yeah, there's an unconscious, but, but demonstrating, explaining to people why this is so important, why it's important to know this for our emotional health, um, for our well-being, you know, um, because he was a neurophysicist. He was, you know, he was a doctor. He, you know, he was concerned in, with, with healing people. All right, so like with, with this, um, you know, this, this unconscious will, you know, that we don't have a free will. We have a, an unconscious will. This is something that I want to promote. I want to um, teach to, to the world, really, because um, for the same reason, you know, Freud understood that to the extent that we understand we have an unconscious, then we can like basically try to access it through various means, you know, stream of consciousness, whatever. Um, and again, you know, I just want to like clarify that when we're accessing the unconscious, it's actually the unconscious accessing itself, and then we get made aware of it. But, um, but that was his, you know, that was his gift to the world. And for whatever reason, you know, the, the universe is compelling me to, um, to deliver this kind of like scientific truth and to um, to explain why it's not a trivial and consequential consideration, to explain why um, our quality of life could be vastly improved by getting the the nature of human will right, by by you know overcoming the illusion of free will that, that causes so much unnecessary blame and um, and suffering and competition and and you know all that. So. Um, Okay, so, and while I do that, you know, most of my shows are devoted to, um, to explaining in various ways why we don't have a free will. Because you've got to remember this, like, if you've heard these explanations before, consider a couple of things. One, um, each time you hear the same explanation again, I will be saying, if you're hearing it from me, I'll be saying it with, in different words. I will be feeling differently each time. I'll be expressing the explanation differently, and so will you. Each time you, know, you, you see this or you know, hear this, you'll be in a different mood. So, that, um, so it may take 5, 10, 15, 20 times of your hearing this in different ways to get it. But... Um, and so that's why I, you know, we'll go over the, um, the points over and over. It's kind of like we're, we're learning a new language in a sense. When, when we learned mathematics, you know, we were doing our, our um, times tables until we, you know, really, really understood it. Uh, now we're, we, we need to um, really completely, you know, confidently understand of the, the true nature of our human will. And... Um, Okay, what else? We've got about two and a half minutes. I forgot, there was another consideration related to that, that if I had a free will, I could, would have told you, but it, it um, okay. Now, all right, so why, yeah, why is this question so important? 
um, think about it. You know, if you didn't have a reason to blame people for um, the mistakes we make, to blame yourself, you would not aggress toward people and you wouldn't punish yourself. You would, um, naturally, you would acknowledge what's going on and have to address it in one way or another. But, um, but you wouldn't do it um, wrongly. You know, in other words, like, uh, I think we would all agree it's wrong to blame someone for something that they had absolutely no choice but to do. And every time we blame ourselves or other people for doing things that are wrong, that's exactly what we're doing. You know, and so like, if you can imagine us stopping doing that, you know, imagine it with your best friends. People do things wrong and it's, wow, you know, like, you know, this, what you did, you know, really kind of like resulted in a lot of pain for me. So I got to figure out why did the universe compel you to do that? I'm not going to blame you, you know, so like, so let's, let's join together and figure this out. You know, it creates harmony. You know, it creates cooperation. We're on the same side of a problem, you know, that, that really doesn't involve us in a certain sense, that isn't really, quote, unquote, up to us. So, and that, you know, I think um, that, that can create a brand new world in a certain sense. You know, um, a world where we're understanding and... Um, you know, where, where, um, where we seek to solve problems rather than um, take pleasure in assigning blame and then, you know, misguidedly um, acting on, on, you know, the agents who, who are not responsible. We're, we're running out of time and I'm running out of juice. This is like the third show. I, I do three at a time. Anyway, so like I hope you're having a great day and I'll see you again sometime soon.